Dr. Walensky. Welcome to the Public Health Communication Collaborative Webinar. We're so happy to have you here so we can speak with you. Um, our audience is composed of public health personnel at the state, local, tribal, and territorial levels, people who've been on the front lines of addressing the COVID pandemic for the last year. And we've heard many of them say that it's been a really challenging year, particularly in terms of how to best communicate with the public, with media, and with policymakers in a time of intense acrimony, proliferation of untrue or misleading information, and the politicization of public health and science. And there's so many things we want to talk about with you, but a key topic will involve messaging, an area where you clearly have great expertise. And I have some questions of my own in addition to questions submitted by members of the audience. So welcome. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for that lovely inter introduction. I'm so delighted to be here with you, John. And maybe just I will thank everybody who's listening because the work we're doing here at the CDC um, only can get us so far. And it's the implementation that all of you are doing day in and day out with your local jurisdictions reaching the, the people that is so critical and key to, to the work that we do. So we're grateful for your partnership. Well, that's so wonderful. Well, you have been at CDC now for about two months. And uh, given the very unusual period we're in, uh, I'm guessing you're not spending your time in the way that has been the case for most other CDC directors. So why don't we start out just by asking, uh, could you tell us a little bit of what your days are like? <laughs> um, I'm energized and they're long. <laughs> um, you know, it's so exciting for me to meet folks who have been doing this for, for, I mean, they've been doing public health for their entire careers. They've been, they've been worrying and, and stamping out and doing uh, emergency operations for their entire careers. This one is different, obviously, right? It's been longer, it's been bigger. Um, they've had a hard year. And so I've been spending a lot of time meeting with a lot of people, understanding sort of their roles. I wish I had more time to meet with more people, quite honestly, because there's so much on the COVID response that really needs urgency and emergency. Um, one of the things I've really been trying to do is say, where did we need to sort of um, have a better foot forward than we had had in this past year? Um, what does that foot forward look like? And, and one of those things is really, um, making sure I understand what the public needs. Like, where are we moving? What is the public need and desire? And how quickly can we get it out there? And what's the science that can allow us to get it out there? So that's really where I'm focusing much and much of my time. What has been frustrating to me, quite honestly, is um, COVID is not what this agency has been doing <laughs> um, for its entire existence. And there's, there's while there have been uh, you know, I think 8,000 people in the response. Um, this agency in general has a huge amount of activity that still has to do every day. And so I wish I could have, I would have had more time over the last several weeks to dive deeper into those activities because they're critical. And just because we have one emergency doesn't, doesn't mean that those activities can let lay fallow. They, they have to continue as well. So I really look forward to the time that I can dig deeper into those activities too. Absolutely. And we, we hope we can see the light at the end of the tunnel as, as more and more people are vaccinated. Uh, so let's, let's hope. Um, now, I, I'm guessing that when you stepped into the role, you had a few clear priorities in mind. And uh, can you tell us about those and maybe how they've evolved over the last uh, couple of months? Um, yeah, so, so there's sort of some overarching ones. Overarching, I, I needed to restore faith in the people of this agency, um, both publicly and then internally. So I, I really did feel like I had an external role to sort of convey, CDC is out there, we're back, we never went anywhere. Um, it was just how we were being portrayed. Um, our science is leading the way, it always has. And so I really wanted to make sure I was very public, very out there conveying exactly the science that we are doing, why we've made decisions that we've made, the science that has led us there. Internally, I had to convey that to the folks here and say, you're valued. The work that you've been doing over this past year is valued. It's necessary. It's needed. Um, there were, we did do, a, um, I had Dr. Ann Shuket, our my principal deputy, do a review of, the, of, of all of what's out there on the CDC website and just make sure that it was 
as the CDC people wanted it to be, the staff and leadership who the subject matter experts. So we've done that. Obviously COVID has to be a high priority because I don't think people can focus on much else, much else in health until, until we address that. And we've been spending an extraordinary amount of time doing so. Um, but we also have to address other things that are ongoing. For example, there have been, you know, cases of Ebola in the DRC in Guinea. So, you know, we can't take our eyes off of the, that ball. Um, 11 million children uh, missed vaccinations this year. 11 million vaccinations were less vaccinations were given. So we're going to have a lot of what I call collateral damage of this pandemic that we're going to have to um, really have to address afterwards. And then sort of in the big picture of public health, um, I think the reason that we ended up here is because of challenges that we've had in public health. And so we need to restore an infrastructure in public health, in, in data monetization, in epidemiology, in, in um, lab, and do so with through um, a, lens of equity. So, so those are sort of a lot of the places that I've been thinking and spending my time. Um, on that issue you just mentioned of equity, I, I know that uh, the CDC has been doing quite a bit in terms of focusing attention on, on equity. And I, I, I think that really reflects your, your values. Uh, could, could you talk a little bit about uh, the issue of equity and, and why that has become such a priority? Um, it's always been a priority for me in my career. Um, I, in the mid nineties, I, I'm an infectious disease physician because I trained in the mid nineties during some really hard days of HIV and AIDS. And, and we, I saw that the health equity issues firsthand. I think any infectious disease doc um, is really charged with issues of health equity because infectious diseases happen to afflict more people who, who are more vulnerable. Um, you know, I don't think we need actually the data to tell us that we have a health equity problem in this country. But if we look at the data, we know that all Americans in the last year lost a year of life expectancy. Um, African Americans lost 2.9 years, Hispanics lost 1.9 years, 2.7 years, Hispanics lost 1.9 years. Um, you know, we can look at hospitalization rates or death rates from COVID-19 two to three times higher in African-Americans and Latin Americans. Um, and so, I, you know, we have enough data to tell us um, that we need to do better in this country. And so that's where my focus is. I think if we're gonna improve the health of this country at large, regardless of the disease, it's not because we're going to have a new fancy drug that a very small number of people can take. It's because millions of Americans can't access what we have already. And so in my vision of how public health will improve under my tenure, um, it will be because we get more health to more people. And what we have is this incredibly unique opportunity right now where we're doing so much work to extend um, vaccinations into, in an equitable fashion. And we're making connections. And in doing so, we need to, I call making those connections sticky. We need to make sure that as we vaccinate people in faith-based organizations, that we have the capacity to go back and do blood pressure checks, or that we have the capacity to go back and say, did your children get vaccinated? Um, and so what I really want to do is have a lot of memory for the work that we're doing now. We're not going to be able to integrate it all as we're trying to do mass vaccination at a record speed. But I want to remember what those, what those, that infrastructure and the layout and how we did that outreach, and not lose too much time because we're going to need to do that outreach some more. Thanks very much for for that, and and, and I would just say, you know, on behalf of I think probably everybody listening to uh, this webinar, uh, the the announcement that CDC was distributing uh, 2.25 billion dollars in new funding to work on COVID that is specifically to address. Uh, equity and, and, and reduce the disparities was kind of astounding. I, that's maybe the largest grant application that, that, uh, that the organization has um, released. So um, clearly, clearly this is a, a priority for you. Um, you. You know, you talked a little bit about um, the public health sector and the need for the sector to um, perhaps um, be strengthened as a result of the experience with um, COVID and the preceding period when funding was either stay unstable or, or decreasing. Um, 
And, you know, I know you've, you've spoken about this before, but w- w- any, any thoughts you have about um, how, how we need to communicate about uh, moving forward in the period once we're beyond COVID in an environment where it's really hard to, to talk about anything but COVID? How, how do we talk about that need to, to go beyond it, to learn the lessons from it? What's your sense of that communication? Yeah, it's, it's such an important question. And in fact, um, you know, I, I, as I said, I'm an HIV doc because I did work during HIV and AIDS. And I think our young generation, we are going to work towards equity and we're going to work towards public health and we're going to work towards getting us out of COVID. Um, but we need to look to the next generation to make sure that they, they take our reins because we're not going to finish this this job um, during during my tenure. And so I've been spending a lot of time really trying to energize the next generation of public health workforce. Um, If you're not energized by COVID, um, if you're in public health and you're not energized by COVID, or if you're in medical school and you're not energized by by where we are right now, public health school, um, then maybe it was never your calling. But I think we will see a recruitment of people into this field. Um, in that context, I think we need to bolster the workforce. Um, so I, it's studies from TIFA that, that suggested that we've lost 50,000 public health work jobs in the last decade. So how is it possible that we could have lost 50,000 public health jobs during H1N1, Ebola, Zika, and COVID? Um, and so the fact that those jobs have been lost when clearly there was a calling for that infrastructure um, is shame on us. And, and part of that is, I think it's uh, underappreciated. I think it's underfinanced. I think um, th- those jobs are just not, they've not been called attention to and it's time we do so. Um, you know, I, I think about all the contact tracers who have um, volunteered their time, wanted to help, We can't lose those names and numbers, right? Those are the people who are wanting to be our public health workforce, who are the good doers, who who wanna help. So so those are the kinds of people I think we need to keep in and recruit. And then quite honestly, we need longitudinal funding. Um, We have this staccato kind of emergency-based funding that does not allow to bolster the infrastructure. Um, I was on the Hill um, and I spoke exactly about this. We, We can't, um, we can't have, you know, staccato funding disaster to disaster. Um, we need to have longitudinal funding that will allow this public health infrastructure to grow. It needs to be financed. People, you know, you need to be able to pay a physician in a public health workforce what they would otherwise be paid, Not perhaps not a plastic surgeon, but certainly an infectious disease doc if you want them to work in service in public health. And I'm hearing from a lot of health departments, they can't even do that. So you're not recruiting talent that you need or the talent doesn't stay there very long. And we really need a mechanism to do that. You know, I'm reminded of um, a a few years ago, there was a a public health blue ribbon committee that looked at infrastructure and what was needed in public health um, and and concluded that a $4.5 billion a year uh, annual allocation was needed to provide the, the level of support at the local, state, tribal, and territorial level, and as well as CDC. And, um, and when we first started talking to Congress about 4.5 billion, they said, wow, that's a really big number. Now, when we're talking about that, that same number, we hear back from Congress, uh, om- people almost say, that's a pretty good deal if that would prevent <laughs> <Exactly>. us <laughs> <That's it. laughs> from spending hundreds of mil- billions and even trillions, trillions. of dollars. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and, and I have said, you know, it was 100 years since our last pandemic. That doesn't mean there's 100 years between our next one. Right. So this would be a really wise investment. Thanks so much for that, that messaging. Um, I want to move a little bit into messaging, because, again, that's that's the emphasis of the, the webinar series. And and, you know, I, I think I'd start by um, raising the, the challenge that, um, that in some ways contributed to creation of the Public Health uh, Communication Collaborative, w- which was that uh, messaging in a fast moving pandemic was really difficult to get consistently and accurately at all the different levels of public health. Um, and uh, sometimes things would be known at one level, but at the, the other level it wasn't. And, you know, public health leaders were being asked to, to answer questions quickly w- without necessarily knowing, you know, how do I get the information I need? Um, 
And, and that resulted at times during COVID where messaging was different at different levels. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your vision for how the CDC could work well with the different levels of public health, state, tribal, tribal local, and territorial um, to, to best work together to control the pandemic in terms of communication and coordination. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I think <laughs> this past year, I think was fraught with communication challenges and it was not just at the levels of public health. I think the policy led to some communication challenges which undermined what we in public health were trying to do, which uh, didn't make that job any easier. Um, it is generally the case in my mind when things kind of go sideways, but everybody's intentions are aligned, it's a communication problem. And so um, I, I do think that communication is so very key. Um, I really think part of the issue is knowing your audience. Um, what are the communication pieces that they need? Um, and, and so we have to spend our time with each, the what is the communication we need to do with the tribal nations? What is the communication we need to do with locals, with states, with labs, with what, what are the communications that they need? And then we need some feedback as to what are you not getting from us that would be helpful to you? This has to be bi-directional. It can't be sort of just communicating upon you. Um, and so we, I, I, I'm really curious as to the feedback of what, and in fact, now I get from you know, my colleagues, CDC, we could really use some guidance from CDC on X, or we could really use some toolkits on Y. Um, and, and that's exactly what we need because that's what we want to deliver. Um, and so I, I think it has to be bi-directional. I do think the communication is really important. I, I don't think you can over-communicate. Um, you know, if you've heard this from me twice, great. <laughs> you know, um, I, I think that's really, really important. Thanks so much. You, you know, um... In terms of messaging question, the um, one thing that that is happening under your leadership is you're you're taking a, a critical eye to policy and making sure that the policies are as up to and the guidances are as up to date as possible. And one example of that uh, recently was the change in terms of the uh, the distances uh, within schools that are considered safe in terms of uh, limiting transmission. And um, sometimes it's confusing to the public when a, uh, a guidance or a policy changes and, and some of the people listening are, you know, are have to handle how, how do they explain to the public a policy is changing for a particular reason. Can you talk a little bit about how, how you think about messaging when you're uh, explaining a, a change in terms of policy like, like school distancing, for example? Right, so, so our school guidance came out um, in February. Um, it was probably the first heavy lift um, of, of my tenure. And um, it was, it was a heavy lift. There was a lot that was included in there. It was I, uh, rates of, of um, transmission. It had six feet versus three feet. It had diagnostic testing and contact tracing and all sorts of uh, who could be what and hybrid and all sorts of things that were layered in there. Um, and we did it based on the best available science that was available in the, you know, at the time. Um, what happens is science evolves. And so for example, and this is the key example, um, schools had a really hard time with six feet. If there was one thing I heard um, for the last month is that six feet is really hard. Um, that distance is really hard. And so when there are challenges, that's where science gets focused. And so um, over the last month, there have been at least four or five papers that actually specifically drilled down and looked at the six foot rule. Is that six foot rule really essential? And we didn't have any science to inform it at the time that the first set of guidances came out. So with now four or five papers that are emerging that actually says for younger children, three feet is fine, six feet you don't really need, it's time for us to update because if, that, if that's what's keeping kids out of school, we want to update it to make sure that it is relevant for the most relevant science available. So really, we're it's a moving target because science is moving um, and we're really trying to stay. And the reason it happens so fast is because it's our responsibility to move quickly for the public. Um, and so, you know, just in that last month, because of these important scientific questions that arose, and because I'm so grateful to the scientists who did, who answered those questions for us, we were able to move our guidance. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's great. 
Um, what there are members of the public though that we've we've heard from, and this comes up sometimes in terms of hesitancy issues, where people will say, well. Um, uh, public health is doing flip-flopping because it used to say this and now it says that. How, how do you answer the questions around, you, you know, the, when, when they're raised in that particular way? You know, it, <laughs> uh, Tony Fauci was recently asked this question as well. I mean, if we, if we, it, it's flip-flopping when things are static and there's no change and you reverse your mind in a static environment. There has been nothing about this last year, I think, that has been static. Um, and so we would be remiss if we didn't evolve with the science. And so we are evolving with the science. Now, I can appreciate while some people who are not following the science as closely as we are says that we are a moving target. Our job is to be a moving target because the science moves. Thanks. And, and again, you know, this message, I think, really resonates with the people uh, that are in the audience now that are, are faced with answering those questions um, yeah. and, and uh, really, I think, are learning from the conversation. Um, what now do you think is public health's biggest messaging challenge uh, in the pandemic? Uh, is, it, uh, is it about vaccines? Is it about uh, keeping your mask on? What, what, what do you think the biggest challenge is now? I think we have to get people vaccinated. Um, you know, I, I think people have, not that I don't believe everybody should be continuing to wear a mask, I very much do, but people have pretty much chosen whether they're gonna wear a mask or not at this point. Um, and uh, they are probably not yet fully decided on what's gonna happen with vaccines and so, or where they may stand with vaccines. Um, and so I think our job for the next several months is to make sure that we have as much vaccine confidence in this country as possible. What's interesting about vaccine confidence is um, that you know, people may be reluctant to take the vaccine for very different reasons. Um, and what you don't know when you say to somebody, are you gonna get the vaccine when they say, no, I'm not re really interested, is the reason why. And until you know the reason why, you actually can't address the root cause of what, what the challenge is. So some people may say no because um, it's not convenient for them or because they can't take a day off of work or until that day they didn't know anybody else who had gotten it. But if you go back to them three weeks later and their whole community has gotten it, then you know, maybe they'd be amenable. Um, or they may feel like the science moved too quickly. And we have, we have really important information to convey about how long the science has been going and why it is that we were able to have three vaccines in a historic period of time. So we really do need to understand the issues of vaccine confidence at the individual level to really get to the root cause and address them so people are interested. Well, uh, thanks. In some ways, that, that builds on a, a question that, that has come in from one of the listeners, um, uh, Chris Cugini, who's the communication specialist in Stark County Health Department in Ohio, you know, specifically asks, um, what, what do you think at the local health level um, departments should be doing to strengthen their message around the importance of folks getting the vaccine? Right, so we have, um, we on the CDC website have all sorts of toolkits. So what I would say is invite you to come to, to use our toolkits. We have them for community-based organizations with slide decks. We have them for face-based organizations. And so really, um, you really need to send a trusted messenger, for example. Um, it may be, and I'm pretty certain that not everybody wants to hear why they should get a vaccine from Rochelle Walensky, but they may from their, from their pastor. They might from, um, from their local supermarket attendant who said, you know, I got the vaccine to, to protect myself and I'm really excited or from their teachers. Um, there are all sorts of initiatives that have been really creatively done to, to move vaccine at the local level. So, um, you know, churches that are doing full campaigns on the weekends in partnership with pharmacies, um, high schools who've been doing that have been doing the same in partnerships with ph pharmacies as, as locations. Um, Coachella Valley in California um, vaccinated, you know, a 70% Hispanic community. Um, really impressive work. People are working in public transportation hubs to do vaccines there. So there's lots of different creative ways, but you really do need to get the local people doing it. They need trusted messengers. Yeah. And we have resources to help. 
Oh, that's great. Yeah, and in terms of those resources, Chris also asks it, it, whether CDC is now or in the future will be offering communication workshops that, that health departments could um, participate in to localize their, their communications based on CDC's information and design. Right, so we have a long-standing collaboration with the National Public Health Information Coalition. Um, so that's more than 400 public health communicators at the state and local level. We've been working with them. We've been working directly with the state, local, tribal, and territorial health departments. And then, of course, the Public Health communi uh, Communications Collaborative is, is a key part of that effort as well. Thanks so much. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to ask a question that we've actually gotten from a few different people who are listening. Um, it, it, it is that... Um, um, the concern about public confusion that may occur when neighboring states have different guidelines about mask wearing or school reopening. And do you have any thoughts about how CDC can help in terms of promoting consistency in those guidelines and, and messaging? Or is, is that just something that we, we've gone beyond the possibility of, of having some consistency? Yeah, you know, this is challenging, right? Because especially on state borders where, where people cross those borders fluidly, um, you know, we have done our best to issue very specific guidance and to articulate it. Um, and I am been, I, I hope, very public as to how we articulate that guidance. And we're working with each of the states to provide technical assistance across that guidance. It is truly the case that states have individuality in terms of what, how they implement. So for school guidance, um, and in fact, it may not even be at a state level, it may be at a jurisdiction, at a you know, city level or a town level. Um, and so we're working, we're doing our best. I would say call for technical support um, because we are happy to, to provide that technical support um, so that people can understand the differences, why maybe other, other jurisdictions may have made different, uh, different decisions. But that's, it's hard, that one is hard. Hey, well, thank you. Thanks for being frank about that too and, and offering the, your, your thoughts and guidance on it. So I'm gonna spend the last few minutes focusing on what it's like to be a communicator uh, in the role that you're in, in the media all the time, having to field unexpected questions and, and under pressure. And, and, um, and, and I'm, because I think that people will really learn from that who also are, are, are addressing some of those same pressures. Um, you've been a skilled media presence for some time now, certainly before you were the CDC director. And in fact, I think maybe maybe President Biden first saw you by watching um, your your work in the media, answering questions on COVID. And you've moved somehow seamlessly from speaking to the media as a private citizen to speaking to the media in public as a CDC director and a senior member of the administration. Uh, how how easy or difficult was that transition from private citizens to government spokesperson? And, and <laughs> do you have any reflections on that might be useful for others that are that are also experiencing that transition? Um, thanks for that question. You know, before I was ever you know a media person on COVID, uh, I was a communicator of science. Right, so, so my job whenever I communicated the science that I did in my academic world was to take really complex science and turn it into something that, you know, citizens could understand, that people in the audience could understand. Again, know your audience. Who, is, who are you talking to here? Um, say it in plain language. Say it so that people can understand. And so that's really what I tried to do when I was talking about COVID in the media. Um, and you know, doing it for on the other side, I, I will say on the government side, um, the questions are harder, the questions are different. Um, I'm not giving my opinion anymore. I'm giving, I'm speaking for an agency. Um, sometimes I can't be as forthright as I might wanna be because we have something that's happening or emerging um, that I would sort of give my opinion about, but I can't do so in this, in this role. Um, it's been really fulfilling. I think people are listening. Um, it's it's also been uh, interesting. I, I do see my face more often than perhaps I'd like to. <laughs> Certainly my kids have texted me and said, mom, you're everywhere. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, it's, that has been probably among the, um, 
most stark transitions. It's not that it's been hard. It's just been, it's just, um, I came in to run a public health agency to help to do good. Um, I didn't necessarily anticipate, maybe I should have, but I didn't necessarily anticipate this part of it. Well, you, you're very good at it. That's, that's for <laughs> sure. So, so again, here's, give the audience some insight. How do you prepare for media engagements? Do you, do you do it on the fly? Do you have time to sort of be, you know, do the research beforehand? How, 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 what, how do you, how do you get ready for say a Sunday morning, you know, one after the other news program uh, engagement? Yeah, that's a really good question. No, I never do it on the fly. I never do it on the fly. And even before I was in this position, um, I would do a lot of homework to say what's going on in the news, what are they going to ask me about, but then what can I bring to the table? What are I think people do like to have some grounding in science to know that you know what I'm saying is grounded in science. So while you have to say it in English, you have to convey science in English um, or Spanish or whatever the local language. But you know um, now I really try and anticipate uh, anticipate who's going to be asking the questions. Um, even, you know, on my recent Hill visit, um, I wanted to know who everybody was in the room, what state they were from, um, because I want to know what's important to that state so that when they're asking me a question from, you know, a given state, I will know, was this going to be a question about equity? Is this going to be a question about travel and cruises? Is this going to be a question about tribes? Um, there, you know, so I really just want to know my audience um, so that I can be really maximally prepared. And I do a lot of homework before I do these things. So, so one just building on that, this has been, you know, public health people have really faced a lot of hostility this year. And, and I, I, do you have any thoughts or tips about how, how you handle messaging and communicating when you can feel that? That sort of hostility or the nature of the question has kind of got an edge to it. A any sort of insights or tips into how you how you um, handle those kinds of questions? Yeah, those are hard. And first, let me just say um, the hostility. I mean, you all are doing God's work to help our nation. So um, feel confident and strong in how dedicated you are towards that work. Um, I think I, I think I know this agency knows that the work that you are doing is to get us out of this crisis and to benefit all of our health. Um, in response to your question, um, I I sort of um, challenge challenge the challenge with the the facts and say these are the data. I'm speaking to you from the data. For the most part, um, people come to you with opinion and you get to give them data. And in my mind, data speaks a little louder. Um, and, and so that's really where the preparation comes in. You, you kind of know who you're, who you're gonna be up against or at least the hard questions that are gonna come your way. Um, when people ask me hard questions about schools, I know what they're going to ask. Um, you know, many of the hard questions, for example, about schools have been, do you, Dr. Walensky, know what you're doing to our ch children's mental health? Um, and the answer is, first of all, I'm not personally doing it, but importantly, yes, I, you know, the mental health challenges are, are really important here, as are the, um, the food insecurity, as are the educational milestones. Like there's a whole host of reasons. And I embrace that because I am making these decisions in the context of those really hard, important other issues that are happening. So I do think we have to embrace some of the challenge too, because we have to own it. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 just one final question, I guess. Is there anyone you look to as 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 a, a role model or someone who's really good at uh, effective communication? And, and if so, what about their approach do you admire? Um, I don't think anybody could be in the role that I'm in right now and not just watch Tony Fauci's every move. <laughs> And realize how, you know, through what is it, six presidencies and through this last year, he has been able to navigate as a solid, informed, respected voice of science. Um, he has been a wonderful mentor to me in my first, he, through my career, but in my first two months in this position. Um, and I have been watching him really carefully at how he navigates some of those, those challenges that, that um, come his way. Um, and he's given me some pointers as to how to duck a few of them as well. <laughs>
Thanks, thanks. Well, I, I suspect you're going to find that people across the country really feel that way about you, Dr. Oh, Wilinski, wow. for, for your leadership. And um, so thank you so much for joining us. It's really been a privilege to talk to you uh, on behalf of everybody working to end this pandemic too. Thank you for all that you're doing to help us reach that goal.